Hey everyone, this is Benny Lewis uh, from Fluent Three Months, and I am talking to Edausa Ness today. How are you doing, Edausa? I'm doing fine. How are you guys doing out there? Yeah. Uh, so I had an interesting project this summer. I wanted to learn just the basics of what the differences are between my accent and an American accent. With, um, I wasn't necessarily wanting to become more American or something. I wanted to understand how accent differences work because I can apply this then to my future uh, foreign languages. Now, what most people might think is the simple way to improve your accent is to just essentially spend a long time in the country or at least a long time speaking to people. I don't agree with that because uh, there are too many examples of people who will live in a country for decades and not reduce their accent. And it's not because they're not smart enough or anything like this. It's, it's because exposure isn't the answer. It's actually dealing with the problems of, or the differences, I should call them, between your accent and the accent that you're aiming for. So things I've done in the past include getting a music teacher who is more in tune with the kind of um, rhythm and uh, vocality. I've also had a voice trainer um, and a speech therapist in, in a different language to explain these things to me. And that's worked uh, quite well. But I was very interested to see Idaus's ideas that I was trying out this summer because I feel they're way more specific to uh, analyzing precisely what is making you stand out as a, as a foreigner. And everything we're talking about can be relevant to changing your accent between your own language to another dialect or as you're learning a foreign language. And what I've learned this summer, I'm going to apply it to my foreign languages as well. So what do you think about are the problems people always face themselves in this and what I've, I've just um, discussed about trying to take on a foreign accent? Um, yeah, you mean within your own language or in general in any language? I think essentially what most people would be interested in is in uh, foreign languages, how they can reduce their accent in a foreign language. Sure, sure. Well, first element is kind of a, uh, understanding why we have accents in the first place. And really there's mm -hmm. um, the way language develops in our heads and the way we actually communicate, there's a lot of automatic process is going on so when I'm speaking right now when you speak we're not saying like okay when I talk to Benny right now I'm gonna put my tongue right there between my teeth so I can make that tea sound you know it just it just all happens without thinking about it so a lot of things on autopilot and that goes to two sides both our hearing our perception as well as our pronunciation articulation whatever and um, when you go from one language mm -hmm. to a next or one accent to a next there's always going to be subtle little clashes there's always going to be sounds that exist in one language that don't exist in the other or sounds that are right. very similar and very close but still slightly different. And when that happens, mm -hmm. your ear is going to hear it a different way than the native speaker does or the native accented person does. So you can actually predict those things first off if you understand the um, phonologies of the um, two language or accents. And once you can predict them, then you can um, focus specifically on those points that you know you're going to have trouble with. And then um, the most important aspect of it is, you know, people say you just go there and it's exposure. And yeah, of course, exposure is a big deal of it because ultimately these things you don't learn without a lot of inputs. But those very, very mm -hmm. subtle differences can elude somebody forever until they pay attention to it. And um, what you find is that the 80-20 rule operates very strongly in this context where you know, for your example of going from your variety of English to the American variety of English that you wanted to imitate, there's only a handful of things that you're doing differently. And once you can pinpoint what those things are, you can direct all your mental energy towards those things and train your hearing and train your pronunciation. So that's the whole point of what I do is trying to figure out the best way for people to hear themselves, hear the people they're trying to mimic, and then close that sound divide in between them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, the project that I had to understand this better was uh, what, because I spent the whole summer in America, so I wanted to understand what is an American accent? I mean, how is it different to mine? And something I found very funny is the, the very first file, the very first example that I sent to you, 
Um, it was I, I, I what I did is I took a sound file from a friend of mine, Sean Ogle, who's from Portland, uh, because I was aiming for that general area, and I made it very nasal. And you you were saying that this is actually something people do a lot. I find that very just fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that. I mean, you know, I, I have my own theory for it, but yeah, people when they submit recordings to me for Spanish or especially Spanish. Um, especially Chinese as well, you know, it depends on the language, people will, um, all of a sudden their voice will go up an octave, and uh, they'll be very nasally, and my theory for that is that um, higher pitch sounds and more nasally sounds kind of vibrate more in our head, so mm -hmm. we kind of hear them more ourselves, not so much people okay. hear what we hear, but we hear them more, even if you think about when you close your nose and go, mm, it's really loud in your head, and um yeah. I think that's that's my theory for why that happens. Uh, another thing is when people hear a foreign language or a foreign accent and they want to mimic it, they kind of exaggerate things and they want to kind of, you know, I really can't think about it. You try to exaggerate Spanish, for example, and you're, and you're, all of a sudden your voice goes up like, you know, 20 notes. And uh, it's funny because <laughs> I, I know that personally experience when I learned Spanish, uh, I, was, I was very fluent. and I But then I got a, my, my ex-girlfriend was Mexican and then she loved she loved the way I spoke in English but she hated the way I spoke in Spanish. I'm like, why? And she's like, Well you speak mm -hmm. in Spanish, you sound so like your voice goes up so high. I'm like, get it. And like, you know what I mean? Like it's just like really high. <laughs> so then I had to kind of consciously pull my Spanish down into the realm of like the sexy my sexy Delsa voice. And then after a while, <laughs> once again, you um, just practice. Like once you pay attention to it you focus on it, um, you build the habit of not doing it, and now when I speak Spanish, you know, I sound like a, some dude from Univision, like some Spanish opera, you know, and uh, which sounds, which sounds, which is what I want, you know, I want to sound cooler and sexier in the languages I speak, so I always make a point to right. pull myself down in every language. Yeah, because I think the, the sound file I sent you was um, something like me saying, oh my god, American accent, and, and that's like it's weird but that's that's kind of what comes naturally to me if i want to do that and then everyone says that doesn't sound american at all yeah. some guy says it, it sounds like i was trying to be an alien <laughs> oh so, it was way way it, off it kinda, when i first heard but it right, it reminded me of uh yeah. those like chicago gangsters from the 20s like listen here see we're gonna you know <laughs> like one of those things <laughs> which is american <laughs> they're the chicago it's american so you know you're it is Amer yeah yeah so but that that works. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't aiming for that. But uh, that, yeah, I don't that think works. Sean Sean Ogle so, is a very uh, gangsterish person. But you know, one step at a yeah. time. So um, after that, we actually did find some particular differences. So I think people will be very curious to be to see the specifics of what you and I covered this summer. Of how did I? What are the main differences between at least an Irish accent and? The brand, because obviously there is no American accent, but like uh, there are so many different versions that I was aiming for the northwestern coastal accent. So what what did you find were the main differences that I think I was starting to get a hang of um, in the example text we were using? Sure. Well, just as a disclaimer too, I'm not a um, I'm not like a trained or professional English dialect coach, so I took on this. Uh, mm -hmm. I took on this project because um, I'm actually making my flow of English course right now and I wanted to have a better understanding of English and all the different nuances of it. So I'll, it was all learning for mm -hmm. me as well and just using my own ear. And um, we'll put up the audio files. I made a series of audio files where I, I would you would send me a recording trying to mimic Sean Ogle, who in this case was your, you know, the, the, the accent that you wanted to mimic. And whenever yeah. I heard a discrepancy, between the way Sean Turning. said something and the way Turning. you said something, Turning. I would chop it out. I would slow things down so it was more obvious to the listener. I would chop out what you're saying, the syllable or the word you're saying differently, and then put them next to each other over and over again. And then try to analyze what that difference was based on my understanding of how the mouth works, what you're doing differently. And um, it's very, very subtle things. It's really hard to talk about just by talking. But if you go, I'm assuming we're going to put it in the blog post for this if you go and uh, sure. you yeah, see yeah. it next to each other, and once that's, and that's the whole thing about my method is that it's not enough to just talk about things. You have to actually hear it and try it out. So yeah. 
Um, mm-hmm. Once you hear it and try it out and hear it over and over again, then you start to be like, oh, okay, now I see what's going on. So that's the whole point, you know? Yeah, and I found just in my own experience in various languages when I'm trying to learn them that when somebody actually repeats what I'm doing wrong to me, or in this case, uh, by you showing me my own voice doing uh, what I was trying to do, it makes it a lot clearer because I think um, generally what, what people might do is you just keep saying, no, you're doing it wrong. It's like this, it's like this, it's like this. And that's not so helpful. I think it's better to have a comparison that you see how it should sound and how you are doing it. And then you can actually see, ah, oh, now I see the difference. Because there are a lot of cases where you can hear it a million times and you can say it thinking that you're, you're doing that right. And, and a lot of people have told me that being in the country, they've wanted to say a particular word, they tried to say it, and no one understands them. And yeah. it's, it's, it's because of this thing. It's because they're not comparing. And he, they might hear it back and they'll be like, that's what I said. But it's, it, they really, and that's why I like the way uh, we're doing this with SoundCloud, because uh, in the long file, the good thing about SoundCloud is you can put the comments in particular places. But then in in your case, you actually took it, re-edited it, played it back to me slower, and I could see what I was doing wrong, well, what I was doing differently. Yeah, and that's the thing. Um, You always know, uh, that's something I noticed and why I actually went about creating this whole program is because I noticed people, when they teach, people don't have an appreciation for the fact that the knowledge you have in speaking and other skills is so ingrained in you that you don't realize that it's not a given for other people. So if you, if you actually study mm-hmm. the way the brain works, um, you know, people actually, they actually put scanners in people's brains and they found that they do not actually perceive the sounds in a foreign language at first. And, you know, a good example to yeah. give is um, the in English, you have the difference between the word beat and the word bit. And the one is a vowel E, the second one is a vowel I. Now, if I go to somebody mm. in Valencia, where you are right now, who's never experienced English before, and I said beat yeah. and bit, and I plug some kind of machine into his brain, they can actually show that he does not hear the difference between them. Like, he physically does not mm-hmm. perceive the difference. So, it's a waste of time for me to be like, oh, you moron, I'm saying bit, you're saying beat, you know? So, but it's a fact that if I get those things next to each other over and over again, I get a series of words beat bit there's a lot of curse words that people like to joke about that is that's the main distinguishing mm-hmm. factor and you put those next to each other after a couple of days of listening to that then you're like okay yeah and your brain kind of starts to make the separation yeah. because now it's relevant to your life yeah. and that's what i'm doing now with my flow of english course where basically i'm getting every single person who's beta testing right now i'm getting all their errors and then i'm making very comprehensive practice audio and practice lessons to surgically target that mistake and so so they can listen to the drill do that for an hour sleep on it the next day now they can hear the difference and that's a lot more effective than yeah. going because you, like you said you can go to a place and, and never hear it ever you know no no that's right and another uh, problem which you, you dealt with while we were talking uh, while we we're going through the process is the issue with um, especially in English is is following words how they're spelt because I have a particular bias from three decades of reading English a particular way. So for me, the sequence of letters must be pronounced this particular way, and that's just the way I learned it. And what you did, and at first the, the, the example we did just the other day of the, the rap lyrics, when you showed me the first line, I actually had no idea what it meant. The, the actual <laughs> words, the, the word. meaning had disappeared and all you, you gave me were these little notes. You were like, me and whatever else you were. And I actually did not understand it at first when, when we did it faster, I, I, I thought, okay, now I see what, what, the, what the words are. But it's because you presented them in a phonetic way. So I kind of felt like because I didn't understand the words initially, I, did, I didn't have that bias, they should be pronounced this way. I was just like, you, you said, no, just say me, whatever. And I and I said that, and then I think I think you said the last example I sent you was actually uh, very uh, pretty good, and and, I, and I'm pretty sure it's because of that because you presented it phonetically um, using 
like something akin to the international phonetic alphabet. And I think it's the same. And there's an issue when people try to learn Spanish, for instance, and they see the letter R and they think to themselves, okay, this has got to be something similar to the ro 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 sound. And they, no matter how hard they try, they can't get it. And I, I always kind of try to tell people to get that sound rather than work from your English R. There are other places you, you can come from, like the, uh, the alveolar three we have in the word butter, uh, like the American pronunciation butter, is a lot closer to the Spanish single R than the English one is. And, and the problem is that we see the R and we want to say it the English way. So uh, um, I think that's, uh, that's something you, you must do a lot. You prefer, you prefer actually to show people the international phonetic alphabet and work entirely based on that rather than the language's own spelling rules. Yeah, and you probably know, like, I, I, I like to I kind of wage a war on, uh, on reading and writing in a sense. And what that came from mm -hmm. is um, while I was in Brazil, I was teaching English and the mistakes people were making, um, and even Brazilians, but our people were making mistakes that were not based on the um, limitations of their language. You know, for example, you can make a mistake for like, the Spanish example I gave earlier. They don't have the is sound. So understandably, they will not mm -hmm. be able to make that sound. But there'd be cases where people do have that sound, but they would consistently mispronounce these words and the only explanation for it is because they had the word they'd seen the word before they heard the word and as a result they ingrained this um imaginative imaginated sound imaginated sound in their head and uh it was so strong that even every time i corrected them they would say it wrong and that's why i realized the power of this way we process writing and especially in the case of english where nothing's written the way it's, it's actually pronounced, you know, like nothing's consistent. Every single word has a rule broken the next word. So it was really challenging for English mm -hmm. learners. So I decided instead to just use purely phonetics because now phonetics is not, it's not a writing system. It's an indication of what you're doing in your mouth. So, you know, if you see this symbol, mm -hmm. your tongue is supposed to be doing this. And, uh, you know, people were scared of it at first, but when you walk them through it and then I use music to make it fun, but also it breaks things down into clear cut syllables. Then you just do what I say, do the syllables, do the rhythm. Then at the end, you figure out what it means. And it's funny you gave that example because uh, when I first had this epiphany about that training method, I was in Rio and I mm -hmm. like ran out into the streets. I, like, I had the epiphany on a bus and I, I made some random, um, random like rap lyric, very complicated rap lyric in English and a random one in Portuguese. And I found a Brazilian person and I, I said, just repeat after me. Don't worry about what it means. And they, they did the syllables took them like 10 minutes and they got it and they sounded like a perfect execution of English. Then they realized what yeah. they said and they're like, they like, oh, you're saying, and then they went and they said it with their very strong Brazilian accent and they can feel it slipping mm -hmm. away because they actually recognize the written word. Yeah. But before they recognize <laughs> it, they were doing it perfectly, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's something I see consistently, um, especially, especially here in Spain, that they are really, they stick to their own Spanish phonetics whenever they speak in English. And as you say, it, it's not because they don't have the sound, it's because they're so biased to the Spanish way of writing things. So I think getting people away from that a little bit, it's, it's like you said, uh, it's controversial because a lot of people will feel you're waging war on reading and writing and you want to make a nation of illiterate people. But like, that's, that's just ridiculous. I think it's okay to do both. People can take, like, it only takes a short time to learn the international phonetic alphabet. It's not that hard. It's like a couple of extra symbols, and you learn what particular letters are supposed to always, always, always sound like without uh, any uh, exceptions. And then you go for it. So I think, like, in general, what I'll be doing in future projects is um, I, I would probably try, I try to say something, and I would have so a native speaker recorded and I would listen back to my own voice, the native speaker's voice, and then I will hear the difference. And I think that's, that's a problem that people just aren't doing is they're hearing the native speaker, they try to mimic it, but then they're like, okay, I should sound okay. But like, like, you're, like you said, we sound different in our head than how we do when we speak aloud. So it is good to listen back to ourselves and people can do this for free, just stand audacity, record yourself, get 
you know, some podcast from some native language show and take a little snippet out of it and try and, try and compare the two. Yeah, and I will say to people who, you know, um, who do those things, I get a lot of emails about it when they take, when they read a blog post of mine and they, um, they actually sit down with their language and use Audacity to slow it down, break it down, that, uh, that, that experience in itself might take you in a couple of hours or so and it might be very intense and but afterwards even though you're just working with like a couple of phrases afterwards you like open your eyes to the Italian world or whatever language you're Italian Spanish whatever language you're liking and everything's a lot more clear just because you've tuned your ears mm -hmm. to these little nuances and that's ultimately the, the whole point of what I do is that like it's not just about sounding cool and having a cool accent ultimately your ability and comfort with the sound is what determines your fluency in that language. And if you if you have a very, very strong divide between your sounds and the sounds of the native speakers, you're gonna have constantly struggle with learning the language because you're always chipping over your words and you're always not quite understanding people when they're speaking at their normal speed. So people need to appreciate sound and its role in language. Absolutely, and um, I'm definitely with you there. I mean, when I try to learn a language, Generally, I, I, I do go. I do use some courses, but my focus tends to be more speaking as much as I can for the first long while, and then getting into reading and writing later, because that's essentially how we all learn their native languages. We learn them as babies, Im imitating our parents, and our parents did not until much later when we started going into preschool did we see words written out for, for us, and we have to get used to that weirdness. But before that, we were saying the words without having ever read it. So um, I think people definitely need to appreciate sounds in a language separate to the, the writing system. doesn't mean abandon the writing system forever. It just means uh, appreciate it in a different way and at least do lots and lots of listening, compare yourself. And um, yeah, so like, I mean, I, because I only did this very, very briefly, just a few hours, it's not like I can switch into an American accent right now, but I can definitely appreciate the differences. And I think what I've learned is something I can do in a much longer amount in foreign languages, both languages I already speak very well but still have an accent in, and in my future languages I want to learn. I'm, going, I'm definitely going to be doing this, compare the two sound files, um, work on that, and have native speakers point out where I'm going wrong and make sure I can hear that difference and appreciate it phonetically and not just looking at the the written word because in many languages including phonetic languages the written word is uh, it betrays you a little bit yeah and you and um that's actually the motivation behind uh that that free e-course i made recently the flow theory 101 where mm -hmm. it's not just um it's not just knowing the phonetics but having an actual framework like a physical framework for what you can do helps you a lot you'll notice when you go to these other languages you have a kind of insight like, oh, this person is doing this, I'm doing this. That translates to something going on in my mouth that I understand now because I have a more functional appreciation of phonetics. Because, yeah, you can know everything on paper, but to actually feel it out um, helps a lot, you know? And um, so that's why I made that course, actually, is to give people, instead of having to rely on written word to understand things, being able to listen to a foreign language and be like, oh, okay, He's doing this. I can't quite do it yet. I can't quite make that sound yet, but I know what it is in theory, and I know what I'm working towards in terms of what I need to do with my mouth. And that's a lot more, right. in my opinion, a lot more effective strategy to trying to get into the nuances of a foreign language and sound system. But even even that will get them to record their own voice, and I think people need to output as soon as they can oh, yeah, definitely. to hear what's different, you know? It's, um, and that's, that's uh, one reason people take so long to get, to reduce their accent and to learn language in general is because they keep studying for a very long time without outputting anything. And when they finally do, and of course it's not perfect because they have, uh, it doesn't matter if you study for decades. If you do not try to speak the language, there are some things you just cannot study your way through. You need to uh, use it in some way, whether it's in a natural conversation or at least Outplaying, comparing yourself to a native, and seeing what are the real differences there. Yeah, I wanted to make a. So, uh, um, I wanted to make a kind of funny yeah. kind of a commercial kind of a, a analogy for that visual analogy of uh, you know, this doesn't make sense, and have a guy reading a book that says, 
you know, how to do a double back handspring. And he's like, hmm, I understand. I mean, he just does it on his first try. You know, you know, and, and yeah. that's, that's what people see. You know, like, that's not how it works. You can't just read a book on a very complex skill and just do it. Like, the only way you can do it is by yeah. doing it over and over again until you get it right and falling on your ass a couple of Precisely. times. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, well, this has been a very interesting learning experience for me. And, of course, people who are interested in the specifics of what I learned and who want to laugh at my initial nasal attempt to uh, see how I progress. I'm going to embed all of the SoundCloud things on the blog post, which people can see linked to in this video description and so on. And um, yeah, so I, um, uh, how can we find you and all of these um, flow courses, uh, Idelson? Sure. Uh, well, a few things. Mimicmethod.com, number one website for sound training, master four language sound training. Check mm -hmm. that out. Um, there's a free e course I mentioned, Flow Theory 101. And that will give you insight into all my things, all my theories and practical techniques for hacking the sounds of your own target language. And finally, if you're interested, I have a few premium courses for Spanish, Portuguese, French, Mandarin, and working on a beta test for Flow of English as well. So I should put an application on for the second round of beta testing if there's any English learners interested. And I've gone through your, your, your Flow course. And um, I find it very interesting because I, whenever I initially look up um, something on Wikipedia about a language, I always saw this weird graph of, you know, the lines going and it's up being somewhere. And I was like, I, what, what the hell is that? And you actually explained this very, very well. And I, it was, you, you had the, the um, image of the mouth and, you know, showing the tongue going back. And I tested it and I was like, Oh, okay. And it can feel, especially to non-linguists like, like myself, people who are getting into language learning as a, as a hobby and just they want to travel and so on, that you see some linguistic things presented and it feels very intimidating. So I liked your, your intro with that. So um, even you. if people don't check out your premium courses, they, they should maybe have a, a look at your um, Flow Training 101 course. Yeah, definitely. Just, just, to even, even just for the sake of that. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for all of your help. And, of course, people can check you out on mimicmethod.com and there's loads of information about what I learned in particular. I'm sorry to everybody I'm not giving this interview with an American accent because, as we were saying, it does take a lot of time and repetition. Practice. I was on holiday this summer, so I only put, like, a few hours in. But I can see how, with consistent training, I could speak with an American accent. It's definitely doable. But what I'm going to be doing is using what I've learned and applying that to foreign languages and reducing my English accent in those languages. So thank you very much for your help over the summary, Dad.